and welcome to the latest CTO Craft event. Uh, this is an office hour, which means that we'll be inviting attendees to the stage to ask their questions. This allows our experts, Marie Williams, she, they, and Hal Carver, he, him, they, to get more context around your situation, allowing them to provide tailored advice. This event is recorded, so if you prefer your questions not to be, please feel free to either email me or send me a message on Slack, and I'll be able to cut them from the recording. If this is your first time at CTO Craft, let me tell you a bit more about us. CTO Craft is a mentoring and coaching community for technology leaders around the world, focusing on supporting technologists in their leadership growth. Community members are over 7,000 and CTO Craft provides them with one-to-one -one coaching, mentoring groups, a curated Slack community and events that happen every week, just like this one. If you're not a member of the CTO Craft community and you're interested in becoming one of one um you like or you'd like to get updates on events um i will post some links in the chat that you can do so huge thank you to our headline partners aws for helping make these weekly online events possible and to skill well for helping to facilitate this open hour i'm megan and i'm community manager at cto craft joining me today as mentioned is mary williams and Hal Mark. so mary and Hal, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves after you mary <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Williams. Uh, as, as Megan said, I'm uh, she, they. I'm an experienced CTO uh, and I also chair the Lead Dev Conference that some of you may have uh, come to on occasion. I'm also a tech advisor for Kindred and I'm on Stonewall and Flagstone's boards. Howell, over to you. I'm Howell Carver. I'm the CEO of Skiller Well. We do deep coaching, which is individually personalized, uh, hands-on sessions with a live expert to help tech teams learn remotely in one-hour chunks. I've been a CTO for the 10 years prior to starting the company. I ran dinners for CTOs, uh, which I think some of the people here might have come to before. Um, I was doing that for three or so years before the pandemic, um, and I've occasionally been a CTO coach as well. Uh, and I host a podcast aimed at CTOs called Primarily Context Based. Um, and I'm very excited to be here for this chat today. So as mentioned, Office Hours allows you to ask Mary and Howell for advice that is tailored to your situation. So how this is, will work is firstly, if you could please add just a one sentence quick overview of your question in the ask a question box that is linked. Just, it's just next to the, the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Um, you'll then be invited on the stage uh, to ask your question directly and they will ask you context questions around just to get a bit more information about you. From there, how and Mary will offer you. It will be in a conversational manner rather than just a general general advice. Um, if you prefer to keep your camera off, again, that is totally, totally fine. And now I will pass you on to how and Marie, and they will yeah, take it from here. Please ask away. All right. Well, let's let's wait for the first question, Mary. Yeah. Uh, Someone's going to be brave. There's always someone who will, will be brave enough to ask first. Let's wait and see. Yeah, I tell you what, well, it's having an amazing negotiation in the background there. Of, uh, the she, is, <laughs> she is strong willed. Um, we have a question which is can we just ask questions via text? And um, someone doesn't want to be in video. That's completely fine. Yes, please do. We might ask follow up questions here. And then if you're happy to respond, by text, that would be perfect because um, we want to kind of dig in into the kind of context and the the place you're solving the problem in. So please do ask via text um, and be be willing to follow up via text as well. All right. While we wait for that uh, question to get typed, Mary, I am interested in the general problem I was thinking of before this, which I've seen while doing coaching, which is helping someone convince someone else to make a change. So someone in the engineering leadership position who maybe is working with a product manager in the case I was thinking of, who didn't want to change how they were working. And I guess my question is, where would you start digging into, into that and helping them to, to sort of change hearts and minds? So there's a really interesting um, kind of theory of change body of work by John Cotter, um, which is which is all about how you how you change people's minds and the different ways that you can influence them. And 
um, that there's broadly there's a few different ways to influence people and so so usually what I would do is dig into what kind of person that 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 product manager is that they're trying to change their behavior to try figure out what the the best way of influencing them would be because i think a lot of us as technologists we default into what's called rational reasoning as a way of influencing Mm -hmm. where we just sort of explain logically why something is needed and then believe that that will convince everybody and that then they'll be on board and where actually there's a particularly in uh, people who maybe aren't going to default to logic being their their go-to. Um, there's two other ways of influencing, one, one of which is just to set really clear expectations, to be really clear what your requirement of somebody else as an individual is. Um, so to be like, this is what I need from you. Um, and then the other is to kind of paint a picture of the future of this sort of attractive future place that you could get to if you work together in a better way. Um, and so a lot of the time when I'm talking with technology leaders, they default into that rational reasoning approach. And they, it doesn't ever occur to them that maybe setting really clear expectations with someone would make a would cause a change in behavior, or that painting a picture of how things could be different can cause a, a, a change in behavior. And so that that's normally what I would dig into them with is like, what kind of, is this a big picture, big vision type of person, or is this someone who feels very accountable to the people who they work with, or is it somebody who's very kind of hyperlogical would, um, would be the first uh, thing I try and figure out. How about yeah, you? Yeah, I think How have you I, I, would, I would definitely get into their reason why um, and understand their motivation, because often everyone is everyone thinks they're trying to achieve the, the same thing and someone else might have concerns that you're not even aware of. And the way they're working is probably in response to something potentially they've seen that you haven't. Um, And yeah, in terms of then uh, bringing them on that journey, I think identifying their way of thinking makes a lot of sense. The Greek philosophers, I think it's Plato, identified three modes of kind of argument, which fit loosely into the ones that you're talking about. Logos, like logic, the one that you're talking about, kind of rational, uh, reason-based decision-making. And then ethos, the kind of I am, so, you know, because I'm me, you need to like just listen to what I say, which isn't isn't great. But sometimes, if, if someone has that kind of feeling for you, if they're like, "Well, I, I, you know your domain, and if that's if that's the the kind of right thing, then I'll follow you," or the kind of pathos, the kind of more like empathic way of thinking. So one thing you could do with someone who thought very much like that is to say, "Well, look, this other company that we all admire um, is doing things in a certain way. Why don't we buy be um, be like that other company?" And so you can that would be another way of kind of that to me sounds like you're sort of painting the beautiful picture of the future way but maybe more about showing them someone who you know they already respect uh, or admire that's well it's it's something aspirational to to go after right so whatever makes it aspirational whether it's that it's another company you admire or it's a joint future that you'd like whichever Mm. all right i was hoping that would that would fill some time while the first First question got written. Here we go. Here we go. Specifically to Mary, um, how do you balance being true to your autistic self and going out of your comfort zone for tasks as a CTO that are in antithesis to how your brain works? Yeah, nice to see you, Joe. Thanks for the question. Um, I I think I've found over the last so I only I only found out I was autistic for sure um, back in 2019, um, but it made me look back at a lot of my previous roles and realise the times when that level of autistic masking was really really tough and maybe causing me to burn out um so the main thing i've gotten a bit better at doing over the past couple of years is noticing which things take a lot of energy and which things take a lot of masking like where i have to spend a lot of energy to be different than i would be by default um and then trying to balance that with times um when i can you know, lean into the the things that I'm, you know, that my brain works that way uh, naturally, uh, a little bit more more often. Um, Lara Hogan's written about this as well. Sally Late has that where they kind of uh, take their calendar for the week and um, color code by which things are most taxing. Um, so, for instance, some managers find one to ones really really challenging. I actually find like changing state more difficult. So I'm quite happy to do a day that's completely one-to-ones and then a day that's completely strategy conversations. And I don't find it as um, uh, as taxing as it might be if I had like a lot of chopping and changing during, during the day. And so a lot of it's just about um, knowing yourself and noticing which things um, are challenging and which, which things are, are, are less so. Um, is there any more specific example that you want to to talk through at all, Joe? 
sorry, giving you time to answer in text if you'd rather not uh, say. Well, while Joe's thinking about that, could you tell us a bit about how you achieved that level of self-awareness? Because I think that's really challenging to know yourself that well. Can you talk about the process, how you got there? Um, so I, I I monitor a lot of stuff. So I've got, I've got some health, uh, I've got a disability, as you know, Hal. So I've got, I've got something pretty major wrong with me health-wise. And so I do a lot of monitoring of my health, um, including I monitor my sleep and I tag my, at night before I go to sleep, I tag like how the day was, how my pain levels were because of this disability stuff and, and a bunch of other things. There's all these other different factors that I, that I track over time to see how they affect things. Um, and one of the things I started to track was like the type of day I'd had and then whether I slept well or badly and whether I was tired or not the next morning. Um, and so some of it I do with like actual data where I'm just going, you know, how objectively, how you know, subjectively, sorry, how tired did I feel at the end of the day? What did that, that day look like you know days that i see friends for instance i tend to sleep very well um but i'm also very knackered by the end of it because it's something that just takes takes a lot out of me um some some friends not 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 all friends um and so so some of it was just about stopping and reflecting more frequently um and really going like okay how was that last half hour how was that hour am i am i needing a third coffee or am i doing fine just uh, just drinking water and, and uh, keeping track of those kind of things as well um i, I suppose i'm lucky in that i'm not I, i'm autistic but i'm not particularly introverted um so i need recovery time but i don't need as much recovery time as somebody who were say introverted and autistic at the same time i think that's a tougher combination to have mm. And um, Joe's just followed up to say, yeah, I just finally got my official diagnosis, which took six years. So just trying to figure out that balance at the moment. Bennett has been rife. I guess follow up is how do you judge what uses energy versus not? Because in the moment, I feel great doing some tasks and then suddenly get hit with immense tiredness the next day. I think a lot of it's about stopping and reflecting of like whether you feel like you're gaining energy or whether you're just on a high from the from the work so things that put you on a bit of a high can be very taxing without so I think there's something different between something being enjoyable in the moment and something being restorative and finding I actually think a, a lot for a lot of us who are, are, are autistic and congratulations on getting a diagnosis I know it is a very tough journey um especially in the U, in the UK to get to that um I think that for a lot of us, we're more aware of, we're less aware of what restores us than anything else. And so sometimes the thing to do is to maybe focus instead on what activities, if any, are bringing energy back to you. Um, not just to judge it based on like how good or not do you feel in the moment because there are things that are very taxing that also feel very good in the moment they can you know they can be a, you can get a real high from having a great one-to-one -one with someone or from presenting to a big crowd but that doesn't mean that it isn't tiring for you. Um, and so sometimes the thing to focus in on is what activities or types of work or types of not work maybe um, are actively replenishing your reserves um, and I think that's a, that's a slightly different thing to try and keep track of. Um, a lot of the time that relates to flow state. So when you feel like you're very immersed in something, um, but it's not taking, it's not draining you, it's not taking away from you. You're in that perfect mode of, you know, fully engaged um, without getting without getting tired um, and spotting that flow state, particularly in things that are not work that that might be restorative, is is really valuable. Mm. Joe's follow up so yes that's what my coach is trying to help with I had no clue that you could regain energy by anything other than sleep <laughs> I find clearing tech debt to be very restorative oh, I, I fully agree with that actually which my team finds bizarre um, and then uh, Megan our host has followed up asking could you recommend any tools you found useful to track what activities led to burnout versus those that helped restore energy <laughs> So I think the, the most useful thing that I found was actually reading more about what burnout looks like when you're autistic. So there's some recent research that if, if you Google around, have a look for it. If you can't find it, drop me a DM on Twitter and I'll I'll uh, I'll try Googling my, myself to find the specific things that I mean. But there's some recent research where there's autistic researchers uh, involved in the, in the research, which is less common than you'd hope, um, where they're talking about how autistic burnout is different from other burnout. The other um, resource that I'd recommend generally for burnout is the Nagoski's book, um, uh, Burnout, How to Break 
I think it's called Burnout uh, Breaking the Stress Cycle. Um, and it was written by a pair of twins, one of whom was a conductor, uh, like an orchestra conductor, which is a very stressful job um, and got very burnt out. And then their twin, um, who's a, a psychologist, helped them to recover from it. Uh, so it's a really good book that's also very, um, it's very well written in, in that it, actively acknowledges some of the sort of societal things that make burnout for certain groups more likely as well. Um, there's a lot of burnout stuff that's written as if burnout can only be caused by overwork and that's not the case. Um, Pick Houston actually written well about the other causes of burnout as well. So um, if you search for Kate Houston and uh, and uh, burnout causes, you'll, you'll find a couple of good articles that she's written about the other things that can cause burnout, which include things like being misaligned in terms of values, um, not feeling that you're um, you're recognized or rewarded like there's a number of other things that can cause burnout that aren't just working too much mm. I'm just waiting to see if we get any more follow-ups or if, if someone has a different question wants to take us on a completely different tangent both both would be great Uh, oh, here we go. Another uh, follow-up from Joe. I've also been re recommended Unmasking Autism by Dr. Devon Price, because I'd really like to control slash know when I'm masking and how to turn it off. Yeah, that's a great book as well. Highly second the recommendation. And then Shilla, thank you so much with a heart. All right. Well, I think we would we would love another question or indeed a follow up about that one. If anyone else wants to to chime in, I don't know what the um, what the protocol is. We've got a list of names of people here. Do I do I just pick on someone and say, yeah. OK, here we go. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, hi, question here. Um, he's lost his voice, so he's going to write it. What do you think is the most important stage and early, sorry, what do you think is the most important thing an early stage 10 to 15 people CTO? needs to know slash do when leaving the early stage and entering a more rapid growth phase, likely after a funding round. Yeah. So th this is great. When, uh, when you say 10 to 15 people, can I just check, is that the size of the total company or of the tech team? Uh, Patrick, if you, different. If, you, if you are able to join the stage, that would be great. But if you prefer to do it by text, that will work too. Uh, the dev team is around eight. So I think the whole company is 10 to 15 people. Cool. Um, so, so the the way I tend to talk about this, there's these inflection points that you go through, right? And it, the way to think about it is that certain things come for free very early on. So when you're less than 10 people in a tech team, everybody almost effortlessly knows what everybody else is doing because you can just keep in touch through a single stand up and everybody knows what's what's going on, right? Um, it's also very likely that the the mission of the company and the, the work people are doing day to day is really, really closely linked because it, you're so small. Nobody's working on anything that isn't directly linked to the mission of the, or, you know, directly and super obviously linked to the, to the mission of the company. Obviously, when you're bigger as well, people should be working on stuff that's linked, but maybe it's a little bit less direct um, is the thing that happens mm -hmm. um and then uh, a lot of people feel like they've got a lot of autonomy because everybody you're small enough that everybody's um uh opinions can be listened to and generally you're growing so fast that people are learning just by holding on and like keeping up with what's happening so the the things that immediately get more challenging when you when you go both into a higher rate of change and when you go over 10 to 20 people in the in the tech team is you have to actively communicate a bit more. You don't get everybody knowing what's going on for free anymore. Um, some people start to feel like they've got less autonomy because they can't, everybody can't be involved in every decision and you still move at pace. Um, you can continue to try and have everybody involved in every decision, but it slows things down massively. And then people get quite unhappy with the rate of change, like the actual engineers get unhappy as well as the, as, as the, I don't just mean like uh, the bosses of the company get unhappy. I, I think everybody gets unhappy with, with how that works. And then you often start to have um, more of a need for some kind of plan around mastery, whether that's a career path or, you know, some kind of time spent on on learning and development or, you know, something that's a bit more than just hold on and try to keep up with everybody else. Um, and then you do end up at some point with this kind of link to purpose being needed that that um, maybe the 
work somebody's doing doesn't feel like the most important thing that they could be doing anymore, but they need to know how it's linked to the overall or overall purpose of the company and the mission of the company. And, and so I think as a, as a CTO, you start to do a bit more translation. You start to have to help people make decisions in a way that isn't just pure consensus. So there's this concept of um, making decisions by consent rather than consensus, where you consent to a certain subgroup of people having the knowledge and understanding and everything that they need to make a good decision. And then you only kind of get involved if you think that they've made a decision that isn't good enough for now or safe enough to try as the kind of the, the two things that you care about. Um, and then from a mastery point of view, people need a bit more of a plan. They often end up a bit more specialized as, as you get bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, the other the other thing that tends to happen, especially if you go through a rapid growth phase after some funding, is you've got this kind of old, old crowd and new crowd. Uh, and so there's some work to do to bridge that from a culture and values point of view to make sure that it doesn't feel like there's the sort of the old guards um, who still get to make all the decisions or still get to do everything. Um, and then the, the newer folks who are being given kind of more specialized or more um, concrete bits of work that might not feel as impactful as the work that the, that the original the original group are doing. Those are the primary things that jump to my mind. How you've been through that stage a few times. What what else have you noticed? Communication is definitely the one that hits. I think hits hardest every time. Um, you know, it's because communication is n squared, right? With with a group of n people, there are like as you grow that number of people, there are way more kind of links between people, and so that's that is often the thing that becomes most painful most quickly that people don't know what's going on or sometimes they just don't know the other people in the company well enough to ask those questions um if you're thinking about this from the perspective of an early stage cto becoming a kind of growth stage cto one of the big things that will change a lot is your role i think so you will if you've been a very hands-on contributor, often the CTO in an early stage company was one of the first people in the company and grew the team around them and is the person who knows the, the code and the product so well, the best of, of anyone in the whole company. That has to change. That has to change quite quickly over your growth stage. And so it, it's, it's about accepting and delegating a lot of what you do now and realizing that your job in six months might have very little in common with your job as it is today. I think another big change is likely to be layers of um, management, basically, in between you and the individual contributors, and which gets to the point Mary was making about people feeling less autonomy and less kind of uh, direct link to what the company is doing. You, you've got uh, seven, eight, eight people in total in the dev team now, and as you grow like beyond that, you're going to quite quickly going to have product managers who are making the kind of product based decisions rather than yourself. You're going to have uh, possibly a head of engineering or VPN kind of role who's going to be doing more of the person management of that team. And your role is going to look more like directing and thinking about the strategy and relating technology to the commercial side of the company and much less about knowing, know, knowing what programming language is used even. Um, so I think that delegation is critical for you. And it's also how you can give the team more empowerment, because if you've been involved from the early days, you're probably the key person when it comes to architectural questions um, to uh, product questions and taking yourself out of that role um, is how you can bring more autonomy and um, more kind of drive, I think, back into, into the rest of the engineering organization. Um, are there specific bits of it, Patrick, that you're more thinking about here? Are there specific things that you're nervous about in the growth stage? Or is it is it kind of rapid growth and everything that comes with it? And how do I keep up? Because another really common problem is imposter syndrome. Um, that going from one stage to another comes just the, the going from one stage to another, even without changing the team can mean that uh, without growing the team can mean that there's turnover in the team because some people want to be involved when things are uh, small at an early stage and some people that's just not what they're they're interested in as as the kind of nature of the work changes that can mean that people leave but also it can mean that uh, it's easy to feel out of your depth or easy to feel like other people have all the answers and you don't have any um, which I think is perfectly normal and often 
not actually the case. Um, often people who feel imposter syndrome the most are the ones who are being most careful and most kind of considerate in what they're doing and therefore ones actually doing really well. But yeah, um, Patrick, I know you said you've lost your voice. So do write a follow up if you have one. Do you have anything to add, Mary, to what I said? Um, just that I think I, I really agree that your role will change a lot. And I think you've got a choice as to how much it changes, because you can choose which elements of the role you most delegate. I think the thing that's very hard to do is to remain hands on and be an effective CTO. Um, but you could remain the key architectural thinker, but then you're going to need a head of engineering or an eng manager or a VP eng who does a lot of the organizational leadership that otherwise you would need to be doing. Um, it, or you can accept that almost career change into being much more manager, uh, manager and leadership focused. But then you are going to have to figure out different ways to keep current and keep technical enough to still be useful on, from a technical strategy point of view. Um, mm. And so some of it's also about you know you can do this in a couple of different ways you can you can if you know yourself really well and know what you will and won't get good at or will and won't invest time in getting good at because i think you can get good at anything it's just about whether you've got the motivation to spend time on it um, and to learn it um if you know yourself well enough to know which parts you're going to enjoy and which parts you're very unlikely to invest in then you can supplement yourself um as you grow the team. The other approach to take those to look at your team and be like, oh, I've got somebody who could be a great architect. I've got somebody who could be a great manager. I'll help strategy then. And so sometimes you do it by looking at the team and spotting what strengths you've got to depend on. And some people do it by, you know, really knowing what they want and then build to support the type of CTO that they want to be. Because there's all different flavors of CTO. There are a lot of mm. different, you know, there's you know, for every individual, there's an element of like, how hands on are you still? Or how in the detail are you still? There's technical strategy, there's um, organizational leadership, so like the people management and leadership side of things. There's delivery, getting shit done. There's commercial eventually as well, where you have to start to, to really think through the financial aspects of things and, and the, the commercial realities. And then depending on it varies by domain how much the domain matters but there's also domain specific stuff so you know i was a fairly well-rounded cto and then i went to a job in uh, ai driven drug discovery and it was like starting from scratch because the domain was something i just didn't know at all and i had to spend a lot of my first six months in that role just learning how drug discovery works it's you know it's a very very different thing than how engineering works it takes decades a lot of the time so it's a wildly different time scale as well and that was one of the first roles where i'd like really actively thought about how much I needed to learn about the domain as well as the, the sort of commercial context of, of things mm. what an exercise i've done a few times with people i've been coaching is to write up on a on a whiteboard all of the kind of components that need solving all of the bits of this role that we can see we need someone who's uh you know who's in charge of like the legal side of, of running the, the tech team in our product. We need someone who's in charge of the, the human management. We need someone who's going to be looking after hiring, which doesn't have to be the same person as the human management. We need someone who's kind of technical oversight and leadership. And then on each of those, basically rating like one to five, say how much you like it and how much you think you're competent at it relative to other people in, in the team. Um, and then that gives you a really good starting point for saying, well, these bits here, I'm going to draw a line around, those I want to be me. And, you know, this person in my team would be good at this bit. And actually, we've got this gap here. So that's someone um, I need to hire. And actually, I think that gets at another point about what's going to change is you're, you need to start thinking more abstractly about team structure. Because when you're seven or eight people, you've kind of got a, a, a pen of seven or eight people, and we're all just kind of going to work together. And then at some point, you need to think, well, I'm going to break teams up in this way. There's going to be this group over there and that group over there. Uh, and there are a whole load of structures and ways of thinking about that. Uh, the one that's right for you will be dependent on on the kind of context of the company, the domain, and how you divide up the sort of leadership of those teams. But it's it's worth realizing that that is something that's going to take um, critical thought. We have we have a follow up question um, from Joe. Doesn't your brain get full with all the knowledge of the different domains you've worked in? Uh, I'm blessed with a very, a very strong ability to forget everything I've ever heard. So I don't have that problem, Mary. How do you, how do you manage? So I, I got very good at a relatively young age at making notes. Um, and so I've got, uh, 
sat right here with my remarkable um and so i just i take copious notes in pretty much every meeting i'm ever in every session i'm ever in and then i know that i can come back to it um and i just invested relatively early on in like getting good at context switching um and part of that getting good is getting to the point where i can trust my notes where i can go okay i finished the meeting i now got to go into a completely different headspace um how do i do that i you know make it so i, I trust i use my notebook as external memory basically and i trust that i've written down enough that if i needed to go back to it it will get me back into the headspace that i that i was at the time um i know different people do it in different ways I've, i once uh, took over a role from someone who had done a brilliant job of just keeping a running document with everything that she ever learned about the the system and the domain that we were um that she owned a product for and then i i took over as the pro the product owner basically um uh, it was, and it and it was it was very technical. Uh, it was a very technical product, um, and that was just how she processed information and how she learned. And it was fantastic as something to inherit. It meant that whenever I had a question, I just searched the document first, and half the time the answer was there. So I think there's lots of different ways to do that kind of knowledge management. Um, but uh, but yeah, I don't I don't I, I certainly don't necessarily like remember the infinite detail of um, you know monzo's exact uh stats for different revenue and banking regulations and all those kind of things now it, you know it's a couple of years ago but if you really needed me to figure it out again then i'd grab my notebooks from that time and be able to yeah same the, the flips that i mean not not the same in that i know monzo stats or anything but the <laughs> same in that um my my terrible memory means i'm reliant on tools for me minor digital purely because i fill the shelf with notebooks and realize that i uh, needed a better way of searching them than I, I had already. And so personally, I rely a lot on Simple Note, um, that has, which is an app by Mats Mellenberg, the, the guy who started WordPress and went on to make um, Simple Note later on. And what's been great is discovering that there are uh, there's a Vim interface with Simple Note, and I increasingly live my life in Vim. Uh, and so that has been really nice. So now I don't even use Simple Note. I just take all my notes in Vim and then they appear on all my devices via Simple Note. Um, so definitely recommend. I would say Joe has a stack of notebooks already. So it sounds like you've got a system there too for, for remembering those things uh, and making sure that your brain can spill over into something. I'd also say like just there's a, there's a general thing, which is the neurodiverse definition of knowing something is a lot more in detail than a neurotypical definition so like assess whether your comfort level of when you feel like you know something well enough is like a very much higher bar than other people's would be and try to be more um kind to yourself about how much you need to know in detail because a lot of other people get by with a lot less detailed understanding than you get from the results of like neurodiverse hyperfocus um yeah it sounds like joe relates to that she says um yeah i 100 percent need to be a subject matter expert to know something would anyone else like to ask a question it'd be great to have someone who wants to join us on on the stage so that we can uh at least hear from you no pressure to have your camera on if you choose not to uh, there's, a, there's a few people who haven't asked a question I, I, I don't know if it's uh, against the rules for me to just pick a random name, so I'm not going to do that. Feels a bit, feels a bit off. <laughs> it feels a bit off, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, uh, my instinct was right, um, but yeah, I, I would love to have another question. Maybe someone is facing something technical, something interpersonal, something about organisation and process. Uh, I am surprised if no one is feeling the pinch at the kind of interface between commercial sides of the company and technical, because that is normally um a cause of friction or maybe people are facing those problems and everyone's being coy one thing i sometimes think is if you've sometimes it's tempting to not ask a question because you've already got a solution in progress and um, if you've sort of noticed a problem and you're already working on something you, you might be tempted to hop back on the question i think it might still be worth asking because it might be that there is steering that can be done on whatever it is you're doing about the problem. Or it might just be that we say, what you're doing sounds like exactly the right thing to do. And then that can be a nice, 
pat on the back at the start of the weekend. Burst of confidence, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or just ask random shit you want to know. Wait a mind. Yeah, that's true. Ah, here we go. Um, someone says it's a bit of a silly question, but which cartoon character do you think would make a great CTO and why? <laughs> oh. This is this has come from Megan, this question. See, I'm my my head instantly goes to comic characters who I think would be a like like which Marvel <laughs> mm. <laughs> rather than rather than cartoon. Um, trying to. I wonder if um, Professor Xavier. Know well enough. I think. Oh yeah, she she says she'll take comic characters. Um, I wonder if Professor X would be brilliant because he's extremely good with his interpersonal skills. Uh, I like. I am not very familiar with his whole backstory, but I think he largely has a strong ethical compass, which. I think should be part of the requirements for being a CTO. Um, and I think he obviously has a lot of knowledge as well. Like he's he's a smart cookie. I don't know. I, I'm I worried think, that I think my lack Road of knowledge Runner, of the- Roadrunner would be a great CTO, but Wiley e. Coyote would be a terrible CTO. That, that's that's the actual cartoon one that I can think of. Um, yeah, Rogan is always like three steps ahead and uh, thinking systemically about the problem. <laughs> yeah, I think we've got another question from Joe. We have oh, we've got a question from uh, Sam actually. Oh, okay. Oh, Sorry. I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing two questions coming up. Um, okay, so I'm I'm going to ask Sam's question first, Joe, just um, because we haven't heard from him before. Sam says, "Do you find misalignment between the level of strategic thinking versus tactical work?" In your senior management teams um, and sam i would love to uh, have you on stage to talk more about that so do you find misalignment between the level of strategic thinking versus tactical work in your senior management teams i would love to dig more into that distinction between ver of strategic versus tactical because i I'm, i think people use those words in slightly different ways sometimes Hey Sam. Hi everyone. Hi Sam. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, and sorry that we misgendered you. Um, back, but... Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. What, do you mean like uh, that people are talking about strategic stuff, but then the realities on the ground are very tactical, or do you mean that there's not enough tactical thinking? Like, t tell us more about what you mean. So, for context, this is my third startup, and multiple times I've um, encountered people who are very focused on strategic thinking. So um, very engaging, can talk a lot about what our long-term plans would be, but I say, I would guess like less, less able to make impact in the now. And I've had the feedback from multiple people that they think that I'm too tactical. Whereas I think for the stage of startup that we're at, that's just the reality of my role. I have to think about the future, but I'd spend a lot of time doing like, you know, hands-on unblocking and I guess my thought is if multiple people have said that to me then probably I need to think that maybe I do need to shift that thinking but actually I, I still think that that I still think that what I'm doing is right I still think that maybe they don't understand that, that it's more of a balance at the earlier stage and as you grow then you shift that mindset away from the tactical you delegate that stuff and I, but I just don't know if the feedback that I'm getting is making me think that um, I should be trying to do that shift now. And I just wondered if anyone else had had a similar experience. And is that feedback from people in the companies with you or is it from peers outside? It's from people in the company. It's directly from the people who, in my experience, have been too focused on strategy too early and then not you can't be too focused on strategy, but not got that balance and then find themselves to be less impactful within the business. Got are it. they reports of yours or, or are they peers or yes. senior peers? Okay. So the, the one thought I have is whether maybe you are thinking strategically enough, but you're not communicating particularly strategically with, with them. So sometimes it's about, um, even though you know that the thing that helps the strategy the most is this tactical intervention that you're making right now, if you only ever 
discuss or mention the tactical things that you're doing, maybe the underlying strategic thinking isn't obvious to other people. Um, and in fairness to those other people, they may want to know that your strategic thinking ties in with theirs, that, it, that they're not pulling in a different direction from you when they are actually with their teams. And so the, the first question I'd ask would, would be, maybe, maybe it's not about changing particularly what you're doing, but changing how you talk about it. So talk about, I'm doing this tactical unblocking, but it's so that the team can get back to delivering X, which is an essential part of Y. And that kind of discussion is sometimes more what, what's needed. But I think in general, I'd say, I think early stage, you need to be very tactically focused. You need to be, you know, losing a day, losing a week is anathema. You really don't want to be in that in that situation. Um, so I, I doubt that you're doing the wrong thing, but maybe in order to effectively collaborate with those peers, you need to talk at a different level of abstraction so that they understand how what you're doing day to day does relate to that overall um, strategic thinking. Does that help? Does that make sense? Definitely. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I guess alongside that, just try and help them to understand that it's not a bad thing to be you know, unblocking the team and working on more tactical things like right now, if that feels like it's the right, that's the right phase for us. Yeah. I mean, tactical can be, tactical can mean unstrategic, right? And so I think that's the other thing to dig into with them is whether they think that you're just short term focused, but it's on things that build towards the right strategy or whether they think that you're being distracted. Um, because I think if they, don't see the link between the tactical work you're doing and the overall strategy, then they might misinterpret it as being um, too focused on something that isn't actually part of the purpose of the company or isn't actually building towards that overall strategy. And I think you probably want to dig in a little bit with them about which they mean, because if they think that you're guiding the team day to day in the wrong direction by that tactical influ influence that you're having, that's a very different bit of feedback than, uh, I can't see your strategy. I'm sure it's there, but I can't see it or you're not talking about it enough, which is the sort of other interpretation that was the first one I gave you. Mm. Um, but I think I think tactics can build to strategy, but you need to check in whether that whether that's the case. And sometimes maybe these people, if they're thinking that being focused in the near term is unstrategic, then they're not realizing that that's when strategy hits the that's when the rubber hits the road. Right. Um, so maybe. Yeah maybe they like I, I would dig in with them whether they mean unstrategic when they say tactical or whether they just mean short-term focused um because that distinction might really matter in you getting back to being on the same page with them i think it's a i think it's it's a hard position to be in as well because there are there are day-to-day -day demands and you know someone has to make sure that the, the the tech team is executing and building the stuff while also thinking about the the long-term vision I, is that I don't know how how long term the the leadership team are thinking, but do you have it broken down into kind of reasonable milestones or kind of checkpoints along the way that could more directly link this bit of this bit of work today relates to that near term goal, which relates to that very long term goal? I think so. I think probably not doing enough a good enough job of communicating that for sure. Yeah, I think I could do. And so I think sharing it and then making those links really explicit um, because people who aren't technical won't understand you know that this this rebuilding work relates to that thing that seems totally different but actually is really is really related and therefore this thing is on the the critical path um, and I think yeah Mary's already spoken about communication and I'll, I'll avoid uh, echoing that too much no thanks both that was really useful did you have something else you were going to add, Mary? I'm conscious I started talking over you. Then. No, no, you're fine. It's all good. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you, Thank Sam. You, Sam. Thanks. Bye. Um, okay, we, we have two more questions from Joe. I'm going to choose. Oh, I'm going to choose the second one because um, I think it's uh, it's the most different to what we've discussed so far. Um, we've also been discussing acquisition because funding is hard right now with the economy. Have you ever been in the situation of being a tiny company acquired by a massive company and dealing with the culture shock and how it will affect the current team? So I've I've been on the massive company side. Uh, so when I was at Procter & Gamble early in my career, we acquired lots of other companies and then 
sort of consumed them it isn't you know it was like the borg uh, you will be assimilated um so i i think but i think something that that uh varies what the experience is like is whether you're being assimilated or whether you're being acquired um because i think there's sometimes where a solution or a product is acquired and then it's really going to run as its own thing for a while or maybe indefinitely and then there are times when it's acquired in order to be integrated into another another product or another offering um in in the in the reality of you get assimilated by a big company then you're not going to win the culture difference you, you, eventually the big company culture will override the small company culture whether you want it to or not unfortunately is the reality um just just uh, it's a matter of numbers um even companies that buy smaller companies wanting to adopt more of a culture like theirs really struggle with it, it i've seen it attempted but i've never seen it succeed um so some some of what you end up doing is when you're looking at the acquisition to try you know if you're lucky enough to be in a position that there's multiple possible acquirers try to map which of them is much is more similar to your current values um and to your current current culture um it will definitely affect the team um but some of it is about getting it to be explicit what the differences are so that you can then have a real conversation with people about it because some of the if you can articulate what the new reality will look like then people at least have got an opportunity to decide whether that's something that they want to sign up to or not whereas if it's just sort of all unspoken and they're having to just experience it as they go um it's a lot harder for them to know whether this is you know just how this individual interaction went or whether it's how all interactions are going to go um that would be my uh, my advice but as i say i've always been on the big company acquiring a smaller company side of it um so i i've seen it be tough on the smaller companies but i've not been the one personally experiencing it as yet um yeah. how have you been in acquisition situation no I've, I've not been in the situation i've i've helped teams deal with kind of shocks before and kind of significant changes and I think there's probably some of that which translates across you know pr preparing the way briefing people in as far in advance about as, as Mary said what the new reality is going to look like and making it very tangible you can also if it's possible to start um, adopting some of the new things so that the 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 kind of change is then softened if if the way that the new the new normal is going to be looks like this and there is an aspect of that that you can adopt sooner just to kind of cushion when it does happen because i suspect part of your goal here is going to be to minimize the kind of emotional and psychological impact on the team and also from a from a kind of financial point of view you also want people to stay you want continuity as much as possible um, and so helping them prepare and then going through it with them being almost a kind of an, an ear for people who are finding the change difficult or annoying or whatever it is i think is really uh are all ways of helping cushion it but i'm afraid the specific situation i can't really i can't really say i've been through does um, that help soldier that helps thanks cool. it's fast typing Jay. really fast um all right um do do ask other questions if you have them we've got one more here from joe we're currently trying to refocus our product offering because we've sprawled a little how do you deal with not wanting to drop stuff the team has worked hard but also needing to be ruthless so the the main advice i've got for this is to celebrate the work that was done whilst also saying you know being a great product is about what we are but also what we aren't it's about being a great tool rather than being uh you know a multi-tool like a good knife is better than a swiss army knife right unless you're in a situation where the only you know if you're on a desert island you need the swiss army knife in almost all other like in a kitchen situation in almost all other situations yeah. you'd rather have a proper knife right um yeah. and i think the the key thing you can do to soften the blow for people is to sort of celebrate that work and thank people for it and to sort of decommission it properly i think if you just leave it floundering or like unloved in the product then that's very different than if you actually remove those features and get rid of the code or you know feature flag it away or whatever whatever else you're going to do um but 
taking the opportunity to get rid of it properly and then to maybe improve some things as you're doing that is something that you can um that that, that can be positive like you can you can try to make it a more positive experience for people and like fundamentally as engineers we know that the stuff that we build isn't always going to stay there forever right like actually we'd probably be better as an industry if more of us built things pretending it was going to live forever a lot of people build things just focused on getting it built and not on how it will be used right um mm. but i think to bring it back to what does the customer get out of the the feature um how does being a great knife um how is that better than being a Swiss army knife? And then, you know, do a proper job of decommissioning or getting rid of, of those things, like take them properly out of the product, to, you know, make it clean and neat and do a bit of maybe tech debt handling at this, at the same time. I think, I think you can turn it into a much more positive experience um, by, by taking the opportunity to neaten things up and clean things up as you, as you take things away. Yeah, a clean break, easier to grieve. That makes sense, Joe says. I, I am, would turn to Marie Kondo for um, advice on this. So Marie Kondo um, has a, a method for kind of cleaning your house. Um, and uh, I, I've personally subscribed to a lot of the kind of beliefs she has of having less stuff that you, that all of which sparks joy is her way of thinking about it. And one of the things that she recommends is when you get rid of something, you thank it. So you address the item, you, you thank that old t-shirt and you say, you hold it up and say like, I really enjoyed wearing you before you, um, before you then dispose of it. And I think it's a similar process. Like I, I don't believe that my t-shirt can hear me when I say that to be clear, but I do think it helps me emotionally to feel less bad about getting rid of this thing. If I kind of, signal the end of it of our, our journey together if you like and i think the same is true with with the code like you want generally i think tech teams are pretty good at celebrating like i've been most tech teams i've i've ever seen will share screenshots from the pull request with the like minus fifteen thousand lines of code in it and everyone's like hooray you know less stuff that we have to maintain and i think you kind of want that but you also want to the stage we were in we built this thing it worked really well we were we had some um you know it, our thinking about the product was different then we've evolved this thing was great we you know we are grateful to it for existing and putting us where we are today as a company we wouldn't be here if it weren't for us having tried that experiment and now um we we want to kind of remove it from our code base before we start to resent its presence before every time we kind of fix technical debt we're like oh and we also have to go and repair that thing again um much better as you say make the, make the clean break and say that was great uh and now we don't need it anymore it's, and it will live on in, in git indefinitely um, and i i if it's a if it's a genuinely emotional thing for people in the company i i think you could maybe even consider like having a small event like like throw a little find it, use it as an excuse to have like a team lunch and have a kind of goodbye party for the, the feature um, where it's like, this is a kind of celebration of what it meant to us um, because people can get attached to their work and they can feel uh, emotional as something they really labored on is going to be, is going to be removed and not exist anymore. Yeah. Um, and so kind of acknowledging that and being open to those kind of feelings and making it, as Mary said, making it a positive, um, I think is a, is a nice thing. Um, it's harder, Joe says, when you have younger team members who haven't felt the pain of doing something that never gets released. Mm. That's that would really be harder. Good. I think, I think the 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 route I would go would be really focusing on what is and isn't the product, um, because it's a really good opportunity for you to re to reinforce that with everybody as well. You know, you're not you're not just. I'm sure you're not taking these things away for no reason, right? Um, and so get get really clear with those folks what helping the users be awesome looks like uh kathy mm -hmm. sierra wrote a brilliant book called badass um all Making about uh, badass. yeah, yeah. yeah our, our, our focus should be on helping our users to be badass like they don't care about our features they care about what they do with them right they care about what they can achieve because of the product rather than the product itself um and i, I think it's a great opportunity to go like this is what our users really value about us this is what makes us special to them this is what um they treasure the most in in what we offer and these other parts don't fit in with it that's why we're too, making making this decision um i mean if you think that some of the things should never have gotten built like knowing what you know now you could also take the opportunity to 
think about whether your way of experimenting or you know trialing features need some improvement or anything like that because i think if people want to know that they're not going to pour their heart into the next thing and then it be taken away some of that's either exp explaining how experimentation in a product happens and talking about a b testing and how you how you approach those kind of things and some of it's about the like upstream decision making that leads to us trying to solve a problem in the in the first place so maybe if you're lucky there's some product management improvements or some process improvements that go with this to make sure that you wouldn't spend lots of time on something that then had to be culled again in future and it's a great opportunity to talk through that with people as well but you're right it is tough when people haven't either had the pain of working on something that never goes live or working on something that goes live and then doesn't do well um you know doesn't meet the user's need um but you know, this is their first example of that. As their leader, the best thing you can do is to help them get through it and to understand it. And now the next time they won't be folks who've never experienced that again. They'll, But they'll have had a more positive experience of it than they otherwise, otherwise might have done because you've cared about it. One thing you might consider is even though it hasn't been released to users, maybe there are internal stakeholders who it's been released to and they can speak positively about it like, we never managed to get this into the hands of our users, but what we built was great. Um, and had we put it in the hands of the users, I think they would have liked it. It just wasn't commercially, whatever, whatever the reason you've moved away from that product decision was. It wasn't the right thing for the company, but you answered the need and the job that the tech team did was great. And the non-technical people appreciate and see that. Um, so even though it hasn't gone live to users, um, there's still a sort of positive external affirmation that good work has been done. And yeah, I completely agree with what Mary said about talk, using it as a reason to talk about improvements to process and then reassuring people that next time their work will end up with um, in users' hands and how, how you're kind of changing the process and learning from it. Um, separating the work from the product, work was good, product didn't have fit. Yeah, good, good summary. She says thanks. Sorry, they say thanks. I'm gonna sorry, I have having assumed wrongly someone's pronouns. I'm just gonna try and default to they from now on. Apologies for that. Um, does anyone else? Um she yeah, okay. Um so yeah, she says thanks. Thanks for clarifying, Joe. Um we've got a couple of minutes left if anyone has maybe a short question. There is time for one more question. Megan has confirmed. Um if anyone has anything they would love to ask, now is the time. Uh if anyone has a silly question they would love to ask, now is the time. Um, which can be, I, I'm not saying that which, which cartoon character would make the best um, CTO is a silly question, but if you have a question like that, <laughs> um, that would be fine too. <laughs> While we're waiting, I'm just going to show everybody the sea. I'm in, the, I'm in Greece, and so I think sea oh, wow. is always a positive uh, thing to happen. Yeah, that does look nice. That's where I'm going after we're done. <laughs> I, I, ah, nice. I'm still thinking more about uh, cartoon characters being good CTOs. Like, I, I do wonder about Lisa Simpson. I think um, Lisa Simpson would be good. I think Iron Man would be fucking terrible. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't think of anybody worse than Tony Stark to work for. <laughs> Actually, I can, Elon Musk. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. You're going to blow can, up the I can imagine him thread with things like that. He'd be a great CTO, but I think it would be very tough to work with him. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Banner would make a good chief science officer. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel so exposed. I know so little about the Marvel <laughs> universe or that world. We can, we can pick, another, pick another fandom. Pick one that you prefer. <laughs> Oh gosh. Seven of nine would be a great CTO. Um <laughs> I feel that like after this I'm gonna have to do a lot of Googling. I just started watching um Cowboy Bebop on, on Netflix and I feel like the main character from that would be pretty great because he's very, very relaxed and there's like a lot going on. Like he's he's clearly doing a lot of thinking before he takes action. Um so I, I admire those qualities in people I work with, and I hope they'd make for a good CTO. Well, I'm not sure I ever see him touch a computer, uh, but whether or not that's a necessary requirement for being a CTO is maybe a topic for another day. Anyway.
Um, yeah, if no one else has any more questions, even though I am, I, I am fully up for like maybe doing a full discussion, full debate of cartoon characters, <laughs> the CTOs, because I feel like I, I, we've unlocked a very interesting Pandora's box here. Um, unfortunately, that is all of our time. So thank you to everyone who came and asked questions and thank you so much to Marion Howell for, for taking the time to talk with us today especially you know considering the sea is right there like <laughs> <laughs> um, you can connect with our speakers after the events uh, with the links that I've shared in the chat and I'll also be posting them uh, when when coming off so you don't have to scroll through our next CTO Craft Bites will be happening online on Thursday the 20th of October um, at four o'clock British summer time will be joined by Ross Finkelstein, who is Director of Delivery at Wattpad, who will be sharing how to use data to increase engineering's alignment with the rest of the business. The link to sign up is also in the chat, but I will repost it so you're not, not having to scroll through. Uh, take care, and uh, I'll see you all next week. Cheers. <laughs>